I called you all here today to bring the three families together. Not for war, but to respect our differences. To look at our past and reflect on our future. Henceforth, when at this table, we are the Commission. Hey guys, welcome to the Commission Show. The controversial Commission Show. Um, you know, Tick Podcast wanted to do something different. Something that no other podcast is doing right now. Uh, you know, to beget all of the, the hate and all the fanboy crap that goes out there. The one thing that we have to remember is that we are gamers. You know, at one point, we all play PlayStation. We all play N64. Um, some of us even played the original Xbox. And, you know... Right now to this day, what's most important is the the fact that as a gamer, you know, we are all trying to come together and see the direction that the industry is going. So I've asked a few guys to, to stop in today to do an annual show with me. Some of you guys know them, uh, Mr. Broken Games HD. And we at one point had Player Essence um, also involved in the show. Unfortunately, we were not able to get him on today. We, we just missed out on him. I think something happened. Um, the lines of communication aren't working properly, but maybe on the next annual show that we come together for the commission we'll be able to get him on and uh, we can reflect a little bit on nintendo so in its place we'll talk about pc um and right now we're going to reflect on the last three months of playstation broken take it away all right what's going on everybody so yeah um as far as playstation goes they've uh, the last three months have been uh you know i would consider it pretty good for them um you know bloodborne was just released which is uh a game that's been very acclaimed by players and you know the media alike. Uh, I've been playing it a lot. I've been enjoying it. Um, you know, it's it's a really solid game. A lot of people are claiming it to be the first uh, PlayStation game that's worth having uh, the console for. You know, in their opinion. Um, me personally, I think it's it's been worth having, but you know that's all subjective. Right. Um, the Order, The Order 1886, which got mixed reception from a lot of uh, different people, players and, um, you know, uh, the media and everything like that. Uh, it was, a, it was a, I thought it was a very solid third-person shooter. Um, it built on, I think it laid the foundation for, for a very good franchise. The main problem with The Order was its lack of content. Uh, it wasn't really anything else. The, the, the story could have been built up more. Um, but as far as the, the actual mechanics and uh, obviously the visuals were great. So I think a sequel would really um, just show the true potential of what that game could be. Right. So hopefully Sony will actually be able to green light a sequel for the order. And I think people will see how, uh, you know, good of a, of a franchise it could be with multiplayer co-op. You know, hopefully they'll add those add those things and actually expand upon the story and just change a few uh, gameplay elements up. And I think it will be um, everybody will see that it's uh you know it's great potential. Mm -hmm. um, for baseball fans, obviously Sony's annual uh, MLB the Show comes out. I think like next week for the baseball fans who uh, care about that. Um, touching on PlayStation Now real quick. Uh, PlayStation Now. I will say that personally, right now, um, I, I I say and I think most people will agree it's not worth it right now. But I think they're with, with what their plan is for PlayStation now, it'll, it'll definitely be worth it. Um, every month they add games, it becomes more and more worth it because they've added some games on there that I've considered. I've definitely considered, like, I would definitely uh, get PlayStation now for that. So um, it's, it's, it's inevitable that eventually, as they keep on adding games to that catalog, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be worth it eventually. So um, that, you know, that huge library just adds to the, you know, the library the PlayStation 4 already has. Right. Um, Spotify coming to PlayStation 4, I think they said May um, 30th for uh, those who care about, you know, the music and app side, as well as PlayStation View, who care about the, you know, the TV side. Uh, they just released the 2.50 update, which came with a lot of, um, a lot of features that a lot of people have been waiting for, like suspend, resume, which one of the biggest things I think, uh, 
that they did was bring the feature to customize buttons. I can't stress how, like, I don't know, I'm amazed by that because, you know, also playing on PC and these consoles never really had the ability to, uh, you know, customize what buttons you want to do what. I had to buy a device so that I could remap my buttons on, on consoles. Because, yeah, because, you know, uh, in games they usually have, like, certain... Um, certain map buttons that you can change in the settings but you can't customize what exactly you want to do what you want to you can only choose from what they give you right. so i think the, you know the customizable buttons is one of the biggest things that i cared about um from that update you can delete trophies um like i said suspend resume uh let me ask you, pro- let me ask you yeah, a question the the suspend resume now i've read that the suspend resume um doesn't work with all games is that true uh, they said it works with the majority of games. Um, I've only the only game I've uh, seen it that I've experienced that it works fine with is Bloodborne because that's what I'm playing at the moment. Um, but they said it it, uh, it works fine with most of the games. There's a few I think bugs as far as other game other games go. I know it caused a, bu- a bug with Killzone, so they have to fix that and work on the other games that it has issues with. Gotcha. And I think they said, as far as you know, suspend resume. It gets you, it gets you. Uh, what did they say? Fifteen seconds. As soon as you, you know, if you log in, turn up from the time you turn on your PlayStation, log in. It takes about fifteen seconds to actually start playing the game, or it takes fifteen seconds off the clock if the feature wasn't there. I don't think, in my opinion, it's a, it's a cool feature, but I never thought it to be something as big as people made it seem. Because mm-hmm. honestly, like typically. What you're saving is like the matter of maybe 40 seconds, which I don't think is a really a big deal. Right. You know, you take 40 seconds off the clock from the time you turn on your console to play the game. I don't think that's huge, but you know, some people think it's essential. PSN, we know PSN has been um, very, has been been a very up and down, volatile service, especially it's it's always been. Um, recently, in the last few months, um, we haven't had any major. I don't think I don't think we've had any major incidents. Um, of it being uh, atta- attacked. Of course, the, D- the, D- the DDoS attack happened around Christmas. I think that was the last one. Um, but after that, there weren't any like major um, security breaches or anything. They have the regular uh, scheduled main- maintenance. Um, but uh, besides, I think they've been doing better as far as you know the, the hours that they're down and the security than before. How, so- how do you feel about like the, the maintenance? The maintenance checks, the consistent maintenance checks, as far um, as place units concerned. I think they, uh, I think they, they can do better. One thing I do agree with is they say, is now what they do is before any major game release, mm-hmm. they do a, they do a maintenance. Um, you know, they, they kind of reset it, shut it down, and then bring it back up right before major game releases, which I think is a smart thing to do. Um, as far as the frequency of it, I think it's a little too frequent because it doesn't happen that often on um on uh, Xbox Live like I've never encountered any uh as many situations of Xbox Live being down uh as I have PSN being down so that's one thing they you know I've always said they need they need to work on is the frequency of the network being down right um one thing I I'm not sold on but uh you know they're talking about releasing it in 2016 is Project Morpheus um you know the VR headset and right. uh and you know I'm I'm not sold on it at all. I still at first thought it was a you know just a gimmick that really wouldn't blend well with with consumers. Mm-hmm. But I seen a video um, that Gamespot did that they tried it out and they were actually surprised at how well it worked. It, they felt like it blended well. It was natural, organic when they were playing like some type of tech demo. Um, it was like a first person shooter tech demo where they were actually like holding a gun and it was very immersive. So. What what I'm worried about with that is they're pretty as far as support goes. You know they're going to have to create games for Project Morpheus to support it. Right. And how much how much time, manpower, and resources are you going to put into creating um, games uh, purpose? Uh, you know just solely for this device. You know that's right. more manpower that you got to spend on it. And I don't really think they necessarily have that. They'll probably have to outsource to other. Um, developers and something like that, and outsourcing they don't do a, as good a, as good of a job as make for of making a game as you know first party studios do right. really. Yeah. So 
you know, we'll have to see how the support for Project Morpheus goes and everything like that. And, uh, you know, Sony has been doing pretty well. I mean, their their digital, physical uh, software sales are good. The, har- the hardware sales are good. They honestly are depending on the PlayStation 4 to, keep, to uh, you know, keep them afloat and bring them back, uh, you know, into the green and make them better financially. They're, they've been downsizing and kind of getting rid of the dead weight the last few years. Right. And I think they're doing a good job at that. They, re- they realize that PlayStation is their strength right now. And... Um, I honestly think they should kind of let go of the mobile, you know, market. They've already sold off, you know, their laptops and everything. Like, mm-hmm. I don't really, I don't really think them holding on to phones and mobile is really smart because I don't know anybody who actually uses a Sony phone. <laughs> so I've, it's, I've heard the know. Zaperia, the Zaperia, is that what it's called? The, Z, the, Z, the Xperia, the, yeah. The Xperia, sorry. The Xperia. I heard the phone was actually really good, like a, a really well-designed phone, but I, I just think the adoption rate on it, is uh yeah. has it been good yeah i think they make good phones but they don't make they don't nobody wants it you know it's one of those things where where you see a samsung galaxy an iphone and you see a sony xperia nine out of ten people are gonna pick the iphone or the or the samsung galaxy nobody's right. gonna be like oh give me that sony xperia right. you know so i think that's you know really just bleeding money at this point right um and I think they should keep the TV division because, you know, they make some good uh, 4K TVs. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think as last thing, I think Sony has been doing pretty well as far as, uh, you know, listening to consumers. Um, I feel like they're more accessible, Sony, and, and the, the developers have – they're more accessible. I feel like I can just reach out to them on Twitter or, or through another um, avenue and – I can and you know I can actually speak to them and they're listening to the complaints and the requests that gamers want more than ever before. I think all of, I think all uh, the companies are doing it. Definitely Microsoft, you know, is, right. that's, especially since Phil Spencer stepped in, mm-hmm. they've been listening more and ev- more than ever. So, yeah, um, yeah I think uh, things are looking good for Sony. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I think the, the direction that all of the the companies are going is has to be consumer based now it can't be i think this product is going to sell because if you put that product out and it doesn't um you know it hurts you nowadays like a lot of times you can't take the kind of risk that you used to be able to take because the production of things cost so much nowadays especially mm-hmm. when it comes to hardware and software so yeah i think listening to the consumer is uh is very important so I think all the companies are doing a solid job of that. I mean, I don't really follow Nintendo, which player was here to um, maybe speak on that, but I, I don't I don't know exactly how they are. But it would be cool to see if Reggie reaches out to people. I think he's the most vocal of um, Nintendo Nintendo executives. So I wonder how and if he reaches out to people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to reflect on Micro. Just think about the last three months and um, the strides that they've made and some of the some of the things that they've done that I don't like. And, you know, to the to the listeners out there who listen on Tick Podcast, you guys already know how I feel about the whole PC to Xbox exclusive thing. But, you know, before I get into that, um, I just want to reflect on some of the things that happened in January. I mean, they had the Windows 10 event and though it wasn't a Xbox event, there were some things that were presented there that really benefited the xbox console and one of those things that they presented was being able to finally have the ability to stream being able to stream in your home now i really hope sometime in the future that you're able to stream you know away from the home over a network but for now i think streaming to pc streaming to uh tablet streaming to you know your laptop Things like that, I think, is very, very important because it, what it does is it frees you from the Xbox console. And one of the cool things about that, I know a lot of PC gamers didn't like the idea of, oh, it's, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to bring Xbox to PC. But really, it's it's honestly for the, the Xbox gamer, the whole streaming feature. You know, so that way, when you when you hop on your Xbox and your kids run in the room and you're preoccupying the, the living room of the TV or if you're in the bedroom and the wife doesn't want to watch you know the game that you're playing you can hop on your surface tablet you can hop on your Windows 10 laptop and play that game you know if you have some really really cool monitors if you're a PC gamer and you have an Xbox you can play those games in you know uh 1080p uh <laughs> 
uh, uh, well, I won't say 1080p. Let me not say that. Let's just say that you be able to play the game <laughs> and stream them to your, you know, your monitors and things like that, or your setup or whatever you have for PC. So I thought that was a really cool function. Um, some of the things that they shown obviously was the ability to now have cross play. Uh, something I think Xbox fans and maybe PC fans were were hoping for for a while. Maybe not with Xbox exclusives. Maybe with like third-party PC Xbox titles, but, you know, Fable being announced as a cross-play a play title, I think, was huge. Um, I'm not too upset that Fable is going to PC, because Fable's always kind of been in that PC round with, you know, Lionhead and Peter Molyneux and things like that, so seeing it go to PC is not a big deal. Um, and, and, it, and in a way, it makes sense, because the way you play Fable, um, it's it's an RTS aspect to it when you play the villain. You have a top-down view. You have to ability the, the ability to set the board how you want, where you want to place enemies, how many enemies you want to place, what type of traps you want to place. And really, it's up to the, the heroes to come in and destroy your maze, you know? And I think that works perfectly. The villain side works perfectly for mouse and keyboard, in my opinion, if you want to use mouse and keyboard. Um, and the controller side works great for people who want to play the adventure side, the hero side. So I think that's a great crossplay. What I don't think is a great crossplay is Halo. There's no possible way Microsoft can think about bringing Halo uh, to, excuse me, and not just like Halo, Halo, but like Halo 5 or something like that to the uh, PC and have it crossplay with the Xbox One because we already know that there's an instant advantage with mouse and keyboard in any type of competitive space. And even if you wanted to say, well, you have the option to do it, it's a terrible option. You're going to be very frustrated in, in the long run of having the accuracy of a mouse directly on your head consistently compared to you swinging that analog stick left and right to try to stay with the enemy. So hopefully they make the right decisions uh, and what they put on PC and what they don't. Um, some of the things I think they should put on PC is games that are maybe third-party titles, third-party exclusives, um, IPs that they don't own um, that are third-party, timed IPs, um, things like that. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with crossplay on that. I think that makes sense in some sort of way. I do have a problem with new franchises like Scalebound or Quantum Break or uh, you know Sunset Overdrive things like that even though they don't own sunset overdrive i could see that being one of the games now going to pc and actually having crossplay. be honest with you i wouldn't be surprised if sunset overdrive went to pc the more i think about it because it, it has a multiplayer aspect to it and that type of game actually makes sense and and though it was successful critically um i'm not sure if it was successful um you know financially and things like that. I, 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 I'm not sure if it sold what it should have sold. And I really wish a game like that really did sell well. But maybe it just didn't appeal to every Xbox gamer. Or people could have just been saving up playing Forza or playing Halo or something like that. But I think it should have sold by at least a million by now. Yeah, I, I think, think it by should've. now it should have. Um, definitely. Um, so I, I, I took a lot of things away from the Windows 10 event. The biggest thing of all out of that is the fact that they actually had... Um, you know, the universal app um, that they spoke about where you can now have developers build a game on Windows 10 and automatically have a direct copy of that hit any other device under the Windows um, platform. So, you know, Xbox, tablet, even phone, if you make games designed for the phone, that can hit Xbox and that can hit um, surface and it'll all be done from the Windows Store and the Xbox Store. So I, I thought that was a really cool feature. Um, I'll get it more in depth than that and why I think that's really the key to the success of Microsoft in the future um, when I start talking about GDC. But something that was great was HoloLens. You know, we talk about VR, we talk about augmented reality, and I, in my opinion, I feel like augmented reality is what. 3D has always been been trying to be. It's, it's something that they've always been trying to do. It's like you're finally giving the viewer or the gamer the opportunity to have things appear in their living room. 
and you know it's your living room, but you're seeing these holographic images in your living room. So I can imagine what they'll do with horror films, action movies, video games, um, you know, just seeing these things pop out the screen, whiz past your face. Like it literally puts 3D and makes it obsolete if they get it to work correctly. Because a lot of times, you know, you see things and you get the product and it's not the same. It, it really isn't. Um and, and, you know, you see tech demos all the time. And sometimes the tech demos don't turn out the way you thought it was, you know, and that we can go back to the first connect. We can reflect on that. We can reflect on um, the connect now with certain games, though. I think both connect devices are amazing devices, amazing as far as technology, especially connect Two, which to me is like 10 times better than the original connect. Um, I'm not a fan of motion controls, but I do love what the connect does as far as reading your heart rate, um, reading your body temperature when you're working out, um, the voice commands, the voice controls has improved so much. And honestly, I can't live without my connect in my Xbox. Like it, I, it literally feels like it belongs together. So I was a little disappointed when they decided to remove it. I understand the business side of it, but I was a little disappointed when they decided to remove it from the Xbox. Um, and kind of, kind of go back on what they said, you know, kind of go back on what they said, but I understand the business a aspect of it. And because of that, you know, they've moved up, um, in the race and they have it stagnated because of it. Um, you know, February was a slow month. Obviously we had a lot of, third-party games a lot of third-party exclusive dlc first with games like evolve and things like that so um i think game wise it wasn't a, a, a great month we had some really cool indies um that came out that was pretty dope um and i think most people who picked up xboxes in january and february picked it up for you know the games that released last season but one of the things that was cool was the fact that we finally got the screenshot feature um which may not have been a big deal to the PlayStation guys, but it was a really cool deal to us because we actually get to, uh, you know, keep those those pictures in PNG format. So, like, if you take a 1080p shot, it's a full 1080p shot. There's no compression when you get those photos. And um, that was a really cool feature as well as just, you know, stability updates, improving the party system, um, just little things like that. I think Microsoft had done an excellent job when it comes to, I guess you can say, updating the console consistently. And I actually prefer that than maybe, say, getting a major update or, or getting a, a maintenance update. Stability-wise, it's, it's really improved. You know, a lot of people say it's clunky. The, the, the OS is clunky. The oper you know, the, the way you move is kind of slow and it's not intuitive. But in my opinion, I think it is. I think, you know, I can glide through the menus easily. I know what I want to look for, what I want to capture. Um, I think that it can be sorted better. It can probably be easier to find some things. But I think getting to things, especially by voice, is simple and quick. Um, so I, I, I like the feature of and the design of the Xbox and the direction that they're going. So that that was that's really cool, um, especially with the updates. Now, in March, we had GDC. And obviously the big thing with Xbox is DX12. Um, we've had Phil on, we've talked about DX12. We had Brad Wardell on, we've talked about DX12. And you know, a lot of people besides Xbox fans and, and maybe a few PC guys feel like it's not gonna do much for the Xbox. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, both Brad and both Phil have said that, no, there will be a benefit to Xbox. Will it be, a, <laughs> will it be as significant as PC? Probably not. Um, you know, the, the API is designed to make PCs similar to consoles, so it's easier to optimize, you know, make games for, um, it improves a lot of graphics cards, uh, and make them more up to date software wise, just gives it more efficiency, but that same efficiency is going to benefit the Xbox one. There's going to be tools that weren't on the Xbox one that will be on the Xbox one. And the biggest thing that people say, or shall I say, Phil has said, and, and Brad has said is that it just makes what's already in the Xbox One work more efficiently, it makes it work better. So if I'm only getting like, let's say if, if, if somebody is using the Xbox One and I'm only getting a certain amount of percentage out of the CPU, maybe like 75% because a bottleneck is only giving me 75%, the, D, the DX12 is gonna wind up giving you at least 90%. 
and eliminate some of that bottleneck. Um, and I think that's the thing that people don't realize. It's not trying to make it super powerful. It's not trying to increase it to the point that, oh, it blows PlayStation Nintendo out the water. It's just saying that the hardware is already good. The hardware is efficient, is, is good hardware. But we're not getting what we should be getting because the tools aren't there. And I think when the tools come out, we'll really start to see what the console can really do. Um, and I, I honestly, I don't think that when Fable comes out, that's the game to really show off the X12. I don't think that's the game to show off the X12. I really don't. I don't think any of the games coming out in the fall that will be DX12 ports will be the game to show off DX12. The game that's going to show you what DX12 can do is going to be Gears of War 4. When Gears of War comes out, that's going to be the game that shows off the power of the Xbox and the power of DX12, I think. You know, because DX12 runs almost hand in hand with Unreal because, you know, Microsoft and Epic have this partnership with the API and their... Um, their software so i think that those two um working together and on the game would be really really special when we get a chance to see that um but i also think that microsoft has a great lineup that they spoke about um early on and i, I like the direction that they're going at the moment so you know hopefully uh with the with the whole windows app being able to get ports in 24 hours uh, which is just huge, huge, huge for Microsoft. Um, and then having PC and, and Xbox, I guess you could say, integrated as one under Windows 10. I think what people don't realize is, yeah, you may lose exclusives on the Xbox end, but you're about to get a ton, a ton of console exclusives on the Xbox One. A ton of console exclusives because people who want to take advantage of crossplay. People who want to build a game for PC under Windows 10 using DX12 can then turn around and say, hey, I could just port it to Xbox One and increase my profits on this one platform in less than 24 hours or less than a month. And from there on, all I have to do is optimize what I need to do on the console to make it efficient. So I can see a ton of indie games. I can see a ton of third party games, a um, ton of PC exclusives that were on PC now come to Xbox and be console exclusive or be a, a Windows 10 and Xbox One console exclusive. Um, and I think that's really going to bolster their library. And I think the money now for Microsoft isn't in hardware. The money's never in hardware, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm not really blown away by install base. It's not like it was with Super Nintendo and 360 and, you know, Xbox and PlayStation 2. It wasn't like that. Now it's about software. Um, you have this medium when everything is digital. There is no, you know, there's still a middleman, but but digital is really on the rise. It, it always has been. So um, with, with no middleman nowadays and you can buy digital, it's going right into company's pockets you know the full amount is going right into company's pockets and if you're selling software like that and you're selling software big um whether it's on pc or whether it's on xbox it's 100 percent profit in your pocket and if you can grab those two install bases um you know for all the hardware that microsoft might not sell i don't really think that's going to kill the xbox division because they're going to be making money hand over fist with this new way of you know, combining these two worlds of PC and Xbox. So I think, you know, that's that's what I've taken from the last three months of, of Xbox and I'm starting to see a trend. So what is your thoughts on PC, uh, Broken? Um, my thing with PC is I'm not a... I'm what some PC elitists would call a fake PC <laughs> game, right? Because... I don't. I didn't get a PC to play PC games per se. I got a. I got a PC to play the same games I would play on console, except play them at a better performance with better visuals. So, pretty much for the reason I have an Xbox One and PlayStation Four, is to play exclusives. The reason I have a PC is to play multiplats. You know, and obviously PC lets you play them, um, and play them at. A, better frame rates, better visuals, um, gives you more freedom with it. And, you know, that's my, that's my thing with PC. So yeah, that some would consider me a fake PC gamer, but you know, PC is all about choice 
and freedom of playing what you want to play. So, you know, that's my thing about it. As far as it goes with um, Xbox One, um, I would say sometimes, uh, like, I would never, I, I would never think you have any reason to get rid, of, get rid of my Xbox One because even though Microsoft is trying to, to you know, kind of integrate it and make it seamless with PC, there are going to be definitely some exclusives they're not going to put on PC. They're not going to put everything on PC. So, right. but I do think sometimes when they, if if the more they, the more things they put on PC as a PC gamer, the less reason it gives you to have an Xbox One. So like Gears, um, like Halo, I don't think they're going to put Halo on, on PC, right? I think Gears has a better chance of going to PC, but even that I think is unlikely. Um, I think more of the third-party games, I think you said that, I think it's going to be more of the third-party games that, are, that have been exclusive to, to uh, Xbox, um, Xbox One are what they're going to put on PC, like the Dead Rising 3s, the Rise, and uh, I think there was one other one. But I think it's going to be, you know, those type of games they uh put over the PC. Um, and it's not really necessarily Microsoft making the choice to do that. I believe it's just the actual own, owners of the IP. And as soon as they're kind of, I guess, freed from their contract with Microsoft to keep the game exclusive to the Xbox One, that's when they're like, okay, we're going to make some more money, put this on PC. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't see Microsoft putting anything major on a PC. Right. Yeah, and no, I agree with that. Um, obviously, you have dx12 coming to pc everybody's talking about dx12 and how it's going to affect the pc market we've heard brad even talk about how you you know some of the increases in frames per second have been astronomical i mean going from you know 15 frames per second to 60 or going from 24 to 120 is insane and i mean if, if this is what dx12 is doing for pc um i think pc gamers are going to be very very happy i think what kind of disappoints me in, in that regard is is when you have a game that's third party and you make the game for both xbox one and and pc you know if it was a console exclusive and it didn't hit and it didn't hit pc then you would say hey you know i might get an xbox one for tomb raider or something like that but but you know right now and, and don't get me wrong there's been no word of it going to pc at this point um but there are speculations that it will hit pc um there is speculation that it will hit ps4 though i think it won't go to ps4 at all i think it'll just be uh pc and xbox one but of course that's my opinion um but but again I, I, you look at it and it's exactly like you said if i have to have a choice if i have a pc and I know that I can get this game at, you know, running on my rig at 120, you know, 1080 or, or 120 and at 4K or something like that. Why would I downgrade? Why would I go out and buy a console to downgrade? I think that's the fear um, of not Xbox, not Microsoft, excuse me. I think Microsoft doesn't care. I think Microsoft is making money um, in that regard. But I think as a console gamer, you look at that and say, wow, well, you lose a, a certain install base. Something we spoke about on our last podcast, you lose a certain install base when it comes to PC gamers. Um, that, that install kind of disappears. If you're a hardcore PC gamer, if that's where you play your games, if that's where you play your third-party games, of course. Um, but like Broker said, if you're a fake <laughs> PC gamer um, and you just play yeah. it because you know that the, the best third party games run on PC compared to PS4 and Xbox One, then, you know, you, you still want to get the Xbox for the exclusives that don't hit PC. And then I guess that makes sense as well. I think it, it's either way, it's a benefit um, for, for Microsoft. Now, PC has Steam. PC will now have the Windows app um, with that and what's really cool about PC is that recently we just found out that Nintendo will now be heading in that direction as well um, similar to the other two consoles and in that regard what I mean is that if you look at what Microsoft is doing with their digital plan and their integrations and things like that uh, and, and putting games on the PC platform and being able to stream it and cross play it and cross buy it Nintendo looks like they're going that route but you might you're going to get IPs on your phone on your tablet on you know your your PC um 
that's huge. That's huge. I don't know what made them decide to do this. Um, and they're going to release this next console called the NX, but this is the direction that they're heading. So you'll probably be able to get, you know, the next Mario game on the NX system as well as PC, as well as tablet. Um, and then you might be able to get, you know, the next Star Fox on there as well. And I, I don't know if that benefits um, Nintendo the way it would benefit Microsoft. Um, but I guess it would because at the same time, you have your IP hitting multiple outlets you know hitting multiple ways to play and multiple things for it to be played on just increases um i guess you could say your market share for that particular game because it's it's accessible in so many different spaces what are your thoughts on nintendo doing this uh as far as with the uh nx and the new hardware they're making um pretty much going uh mobile um honestly I haven't given it uh, too much thought simply because like, I, I'm, I've been pretty vocal. I'm not like exactly, I'm not the biggest fan of what Nintendo is doing with the, uh, you know, the Wii U. It, they just don't cater to, to me as, as a gamer. Um, so I don't necessarily find it too interesting and I'm not too concerned with what they're doing as far as uh, putting games on mobile um, and, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm not too sure ex exactly. Like, I've read everything that they said, but I'm not exactly too sure what their plans are. And as far as, you know, mobile gaming, I'm not, you know, I don't have a Vita. I don't have a 3DS. I've always, I've been saying since last year, I'm going to buy a Vita. I'm going to buy a 3DS. I've been saying it forever. I still haven't done it simply because I think console gaming is just way better. I really don't have any situation in my life where I want to play games on the go you know, um, or have found, like, I absolutely have to have this handheld to play this game, right? So I, I haven't come across any situation with that. Like I said, Nintendo, they don't really make the games that interest me fully as a gamer. Like, I'm going to get one most likely this year, probably for, like, a Star Fox or anything, but they they just don't make that game like, yo, I got to get this game or I can't wait till this game comes out. They just don't make that for me, so right now like what the things they do don't i keep up with it but i'm honestly not that interested as far as my concern goes i want to know everything that you know is going on with the xbox one and ps4 the wii u is like at the back of my mind it's funny because you know i grew up on super nintendo um it's one of my favorite consoles of all time and as a as a guy who grew up on super nintendo i always root for nintendo to come out with something you know with a backbone it's like when i think of nintendo i think of children that's what i think of i think of you know awesome platformers don't get me wrong i love donkey kong donkey kong country is one of my favorite games of all time the music the ambiance was amazing but at this point in time in my life as an adult it's not something that i'm rushing out to spend 60 bucks on um, same thing with Mario. I'm not rushing out to spend 60 bucks on it. Now, you give me a mature Metroid. You give me um, a, a good space shooter in Star Fox. Um, Mario Kart, which I love. It's fun. I think that if Nintendo's, um, I guess you could say, um, network was stronger on the level of Xbox Live or PSN, then I think that would make sense to, to make it go, uh, be able to play that and both aspects um, online and versus, um, you know, eight on eight. I'm excuse me, not eight on eight. You could do eight on eight. That'd be cool. Sixteen players if you put sixteen characters in the game, um, or four v four um, if you wanted to do teams, or just in a race with like eight, eight other players all in uh, one race. You know, one of the more difficult races, like you know the the rainbow tracks and things like that. So, but they don't have that. I've never heard of Nintendo having this strong online network. Um, and I, I really hope that with the next console, they do that. I really hope that they are on a level um, where I can say, hey, you know what? I want to get this console because it's finally on the level of the consoles that we have now or more powerful. On top of that, they put more mature stuff on there. You have um, the, the more hardcore, more um, mature games on there as well. 
and then you can have Nintendo complement that with some of their platformers and and titles that are more built for kids. Yeah, that's why like that's one of my problems with Nintendo is they don't really seem to care about online. And everybody who watches me knows I'm all about online gaming. You know, my subscribers make a joke that any game that comes out, you know, even if it's a even if it's like a game that's known for its single player, they make a joke, I'm going to go to the multiplayer first because that's what I am going to do. I don't care what game it is. If it has multiplayer, I'm going to the multiplayer first. And with Nintendo games, it's like, okay, some of them have multiplayer, but a lot, a lot of them don't. That should. So that's, you know, one of my problems with it. And the other problem is its variety of genres. Even games that have on Nintendo that are different in genre, they kind of still fit in that same boat of a Nintendo type game, right? And a lot of people will say, you know, there's no such thing as a Nintendo type it game, is. but there is. Yeah, it is. You know, there, Splatoon. there is. Splatoon let's, falls let's... right into that category. There's a new IP. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's not that Splatoon couldn't be a game on PS4 or Xbox One, but which when if you look at Splatoon, right, if so, if you listed right, put images up of all the con all the exclusives for all the uh, you know all the consoles, and you told someone who didn't play games, which which one matches, right? You look at Splatoon, which console do you think make this? It fits with Nintendo's type of type of game. And their, you know, their genre and everything, I think they lack variety. Like, for example, with the Xbox One, I can play Rise, a, 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 hack, a kind of hack and slash, and I could play Forza, a racer, then, you know, um, Halo, a first-person shooter, and all of these have online features. You know, that's three different genres right off the bat. Um, Nintendo has these genres, kind of, but not so much. They kind of lack that they lack the variety in genres and the um and the online all as far as like their most of their first party games typically the same kind of adventure type of game that we've known since we were kids and you know a lot of people a lot of the they don't like the whole old oh, Nintendo is for kids thing it's and it's not that Nintendo is necessarily it caters to kids. Let's be real. It caters to them and it appeals to them. It's just that when you were a kid, like you said, same thing for me, you know, my first console was that I actually bought was a Super Nintendo. I played the original Nintendo, but my first console I bought was a Super Nintendo. And of course, as a kid, I loved it. But as you grew older, your interest in different types of things expanded. So you weren't necessarily interested in the same thing you were back then. You know, I think a lot of people think it's hate of Nintendo games. It's not hate. It's it's not hate of anything. It's simply that I've been I played that game 20 years ago when I was a when I was a child. I I understand that the games are different now, but it's still at heart at the core that this this 3D Mario still came from the the from the source of that Mario I played when I was five. So I don't want to be playing necessarily the same thing I did 20 years ago. That's why these new games, these new IPs that Microsoft and Sony make interest me more because they just renew they renew themselves even though it may be uh, same genre, different IP. At least it's a new IP to me, and they try to change up certain things so it feels fresh. So that's you know that's my main thing, my main problem with Nintendo and the Wii U is they don't seem to care about online, and they don't seem to make the uh, the titles and the type of games that interest me at this point in my life. Now, guys, I don't want you to think this is an Xbox PlayStation bash party on Nintendo. That is not. It's really not. It's yeah, just it's that not. Yeah, we're just. Just stating like my, just stating my complaint about it. You know, like I'm sorry, Player Essence isn't here. Like like you said, but this isn't this is not a bashing thing. It's simply my my thoughts on it and why you know it doesn't fit me as a gamer in my yeah. Needs. No, I, I feel I feel slightly similar. Um, you know, we we do a lot of things especially a lot of the Xbox community wants to see a lot of these rare games come back, which fall into that Nintendo category. Um, I, I myself honestly have never played Banjo-Kazooie. I've never played Conquer. 
even when it was on the Xbox. I have it, but I've heard so much about it that I'm excited to play it. Um, but for me, I played Mario. I've played Donkey Kong. I've played those games already. Um, and I don't want to sound like a hypocrite because those games kind of cater, well, not conquer, but Banjo kind of caters towards the younger crowd. But I feel a little excited to play it because of everything that I've heard about it. Um, and I've and I've never played it before, you know, ever. Um, so something like Ori, which is an excellent platformer, in my opinion, um, to me, is great because even though as a platformer, it seems like it's for the teens, there's a really deep, in-depth story behind it um, that really is um, emotional. It's a very emotional game, and I think I like stuff like that. I'm not saying Mario needs to be emotional crying over the princess, but at the same time, um, I just want something that says to me, hey, we have a new IP from Nintendo, and it's this new IP that is rated M, and it's going to be this great either action, adventure, you know, hack and slash, RPG, or shooter, and then at the same time, I can say, hey, look, Mario Party 8 is out. You know, I have a Nintendo. I can go out and pick that up along with this new IP and that new IP. Um, and and they're, they're starting to grow up a little bit. I'm not asking them to grow up completely. I'm just saying grow up a little bit. That makes me feel like, hey, this the console is worth getting. Um, and that's no disrespect because, look, last year, Nintendo had, like, the highest rated exclusives. That's all they... That's all the, the talk was, was about these exclusives. And the one thing that I can say about Nintendo is the quality of the games um, are impressive. You don't see a lot of complaints from Nintendo gamers about, oh, the game crashed or the game has bugs or there's faces missing or there's something wrong with it. As far as those IPs are concerned, they're, when you get them, you're able to play them and the bugs in them are minimal. Um, and that's not something I can say about um, third-party games with PlayStation and the Xbox One. So, uh, you know, we're just going to finish up. We want to reflect on what we want to see um, from Xbox and PlayStation in the future. Um, Broken, what do you think Sony needs to do to continue um, on the path that they're going of success? Um, I, first of all, with PSN, I think they, need, they do just need to make sure there's no more uh, incidents like there have been in the past of PlayStation being down. And some things you just can't avoid no matter how much security you have, right? Um, but they need to minimize uh, the events of it. Um, as far as games, I want to see I want to see them finally release some games that have been in limbo for a long time, like the last last Guardian, um, things that were pretty much rumored and thought to be coming since the PS3. Uh, like Siphon Filter, it's rumored that that's what Sony Bend is working on, is Siphon Filter. Um, I don't know if we'll ever see another getaway. Uh, but yeah, there's plenty of games that PlayStation, uh, PlayStation fans are definitely waiting for. It's just in limbo, and they're waiting. Um, and you know, we, we just want to see. So I just want to really see them get those exclusives out there because uh, you know it, it's wanted. Um, there's a lot of features that I personally don't care about, but I know a lot of other games care about them as far as um, the um, PSN goes, like the DNLA, I think it is, um, and uh, other things like that. I honestly don't keep keep up with, with that stuff because me personally, I don't care about it, but I know it's a want of others. I'm the type of gamer, I don't really use all these apps like I don't use my PlayStation for music or I, I don't even watch Netflix on my consoles. Um, I'm really one of those gamers. I just turn on the console and I go straight to a game. If I, I wouldn't know anything about all these other um, features that people want in firmware updates, but they're wanted. So um, Sony need, needs to, uh, and, and they've said they, they're working on it and it's been a while. So Sony needs to get uh, those out. Um, other than that, uh, I think uh, they just need to, um, like I said, work on work on those games, um, and uh, keep the lines of communication open with uh, you know with the with the fans and everything like that. Uh, delays are hitting every every um, everybody. <laughs> nothing that can do nothing that can be done about that simply because the developmental 
uh, time of games this generation is like is significantly longer than it was last generation. Um, but you know, try to get those out out on time. Um, and I think that's uh, I think that's for the most part it. You know, they just need to keep doing what they're what they're doing. Keep adding those games to PlayStation now. Uh, stop! Don't make any more stupid, you know, mistakes. Sony has these like little blunders that they that they that are comical mm-hmm. that they do, losing losing a list of you know winners for a PlayStation Anniversary Edition, <laughs> for getting to for getting to trademark um, renew a trademark of of a game that just came out. Just you know, silly stupid things like that. Um, and uh, I think I think they'll be good. That's really all I got. I think on Xbox part. Um, I think what's really important for them as far as their install base is concerned is to make sure that when they start to implement this cross play cross buy um, thing that they're going to do that they are very careful with what they put on um, PC as far as exclusives is concerned Um, I think fans and I've seen it I've seen it in my comment section I've seen it on Twitter I think fans will feel of the console will feel really and completely betrayed if they put these flagship titles on PC. Um, I don't think they really understand what they have on their hands as far as the console gamer is concerned. Um, you know, the console gamer is their bread and butter right now. They're trying to get the PC gamer back, but the console gamer is their bread and butter. The console gamer is the person that's paying for Xbox Live. You know, the console gamer is the people that's out there buying all their digital games and, you know, getting all of the DLC that is keeping the Xbox uh, Xbox Live, you know, functioning the way it's supposed to function. So I think it's important that they don't, um, you know, betray them in, in that way. I'm not saying it's a betrayal for Microsoft as a business. It makes sense because you're all about profit. You know, you can't create the next console you can't make the next ip unless you're bringing in profit and if you're not successful that's not going to happen so for them doing this getting the game in more people's hands increasing their market share as far as software is concerned and and for people who don't understand this um you know for any of the sony listeners out there um you know what what if you if you haven't heard take podcast um i've spoken about this before you know, what's crazy is that Microsoft doing this PC thing is really about to open up their software side if it works properly. Um, they're obviously going to have to put something on there that makes um, the Steam player go over to the Xbox app to purchase the game um, or, or make the the Xbox gamer go purchase the game and then be able to play it on PC as well when they're away. So... If they're able to do that, they can really open up their install base. I think it's like 80 million people, 80 million accounts on Steam. Um, Now that's integrated to Windows 10. You give them the Windows, I mean, you give them the Xbox One app with that. So when they decide to cross over from the Steam app to the Windows app, because it's all integrated into one system, now they have access to the Windows Store and they can see what's not on Steam that's in the Windows Store. That's exclusive to Microsoft and exclusive to Windows. So that really opens up a whole lot. And Windows 10 is free. That's the biggest thing. It's free for an entire year. So I think they just have to be careful and what they put in the Windows store, what they make um, cross play and cross buy. Um, as far as Microsoft is concerned um, with the console, the Xbox One, I think the Xbox One is actually, you know, a, a console that I think people have the wrong idea about. You have a new regime, you have new people running the direction of the Xbox division, and it's nothing like it was a few years ago, you know, where they didn't have new IPs, they weren't making new IPs, they weren't listening to the fans. They've completely done a 180 in that regard. Um, for some people, it may seem like they've you know, went back on their word. For others, is it was the right thing to do. But you know, we got games like Scalebound coming out. That's Microsoft own. Orient Blonde Force just released. That's Microsoft own. You have Quantum Break that got de- that may possibly be delayed. I won't say it got delayed. May possibly be delayed to 2016. But I honestly think it's it's the best thing for them. If you come out with a rare game this year 
Then you turn around, you drop Scalebound, Tomb Raider, Forza 6, Halo 5. Um, then you have, they about to drop Neverwinter, you know, a MMO, which is the first MMO to come out on Xbox One. And from what I've read in the previews, you know, one of the better MMOs, um, especially being used with controller, um, I think that game-wise, they're on the right direction. Game-wise, they have more genres of games than they've ever had before. Getting Elite Dangerous, no matter how people want to play it, was huge. That was a huge move in getting Elite Dangerous on the console because it gave them a genre that they didn't have before. Um, I think what they need now is to continue to figure out a way to bring the hack and slash genre and more RPGs and continue to work with their Japanese partners and bring in those Japanese exclusives um, to Xbox One. Um, I think they're doing well with the Final Fantasies, you know, the typical games, but I think they need more Japanese exclusives or, or more continuations of the ones that they had, like Lost Odyssey and Blue Dragon, um, things like that. So if they can continue to work with their partners, even though... In Japan, they, you know, listen, we know Japan has been a failed experiment, but I understand why they have to keep it there. They have to. Um, you, you may have a niche group of Xbox gamers there, but having a presence in Japan still keeps developers interested in the console. Um, and then having them be able to use this Windows 10 um, universal app, which allows you to make one game for every platform and be able to port it to the Xbox One in 24 hours and in some of the bigger titles up to a month. That's amazing. I think that's going to be a big incentive for developers who work on PC and developers who are going to release games on PC, which will say, hey, I might as well just go ahead and port it to Xbox One and boom, now you got more games on the xbox one so i think they're going in the right direction i think the fans and gamers and consumers out there will eventually see what microsoft is doing i think they have to figure out a way to market the xbox better worldwide i, I think um, one thing i've been telling people is a lot of people are just um trying to hold on to something like microsoft did in the past you know at the beginning with the xbox one but I, i've told people like there's no way you can deny the console anymore, especially, I feel like if you, you should, you probably should have bought bought an Xbox right. one already. Um, but if you haven't, there's no way you can deny it after this yeah. holiday. I think after this holiday, if you're just not buying one, you're still holding on to something, something's wrong. Like, cause with, they pretty much have this fall on lock. They have this holiday season on lock because Zelda just got right. delayed. Uncharted's right. delayed. They as as they have their triple package that they need. Their their holiday season is is done. They have it down packed already with Halo, Forza, and Tomb Raider. They're set already. So I don't see how you can let those three games say that no, that's not good enough reason to buy an Xbox One. I think at that point you're kind of just in denial and denying the console. For I don't know whatever yeah, I, reason. I, I think so too. I think I mean you you have to think about Fable Legends is dropping a free to play title. You don't even have to buy it. <laughs> it's just free to play. All you gotta do is try it. And uh, you know they're trying to use this as one of the first DX12 ported games. We'll see how that how successful that is. I'm gonna be playing it because I love Fable. Um, but if they if they turn around. And they, and they talk about maybe some type of Gears collection. I know there's been a lot of denial out there. But let's just say, for example, um, you know, like Aaron Greenberg said, deny everything. If it's a rumor, deny everything. If You know, they're not giving up any information. If it's true and they drop Gears collection along with whatever they have at the end of this, at the end of the year, this fall, plus whatever they haven't talked about at E3 that's going to come this year, they do have it on lock. And I think anybody... Who doesn't recognize that is really just being either a major hater or just you know completely blinded um you know by their console of choice so yeah and uh with sony they just need to uh i guess figure out something that they something for the rest of the year because there is the you know god of war collection which is well not collection three actually and i think it's rumored that they're releasing ascensions also i don't know i'm not sure i've been hearing conflicting information but god of war three remastered and the only thing besides that that i think is guaranteed for this year is uh until dawn but as far as um you know this fall 
I, we don't know what what they have to offer the consumer. They, things could be announced at E3, but I can't see. I've said I can't see anything major being announced at E3 and then coming out um, this fall to kind of uh, give people give something people something to play on the PlayStation side. So that's why I think like yeah, Microsoft uh, definitely and Xbox One definitely have it on lock um, this holiday season, and that's something that Sony's made the mistake of doing twice. Um, in the holiday, you know, two that's going to be like two years in a row. Right. So that's something they need they need to work on and think about for right. next fall. Well, guys, uh, I really appreciate you guys for for stopping in and listening to our first show of the commission. Um, if you don't know what the commission is about, it's it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You know, think of how it used to be back in the day. You used to have these mafia families sit down, you know, come together, talk about their issues, their problems, get those things resolved, um, and and you know, go back to their lives. And that's what we've done. We've we've come together. We sat down the Xbox, the PlayStation, the PC, and hopefully next time, the Wii U. And we reflect on uh, you know, what the platforms are doing. The direction the industry is going um, and, and the way things look in the future for us gamers, because in the end, what's most important is the gamer, um, you know, not the consoles. The consoles are the things that we love to play on and they're important to us. But the gamer is what's important. What do you like? What are you interested in? What do you want to spend your money on and what direction the industry is going? Because we, we don't want to see the, the industry fail. So it's important that as gamers, we all respect each other's choices. So, Broken, I want to thank you, man, for 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 coming on and uh, joining this show. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll set this up again in three months, so we can reflect on the next three months. Uh, that'll be right around close to E3, so that'll be pretty cool. Yeah. And we are currently in talks with Jeff Keeley, the uh, hostess with the mostest. You guys know him from the game award show that's been happening over the last couple of years uh, from spike tv now it's in vegas and they had the award show last year so he'll be on the show as well and we're trying to set up something with him so definitely stay tuned uh, we're going to reach out to uh phil spencer and try to get him on the show before e3 and then eventually, you know, at the end of the year, we're going to try to do and make it an annual show where we get to talk to him in October during the fall. So we really appreciate you all for listening. Um, you know, Take is going to be bringing lots of new content. So stay tuned. So we thank you again. We will see you guys in the next two weeks. I'm your host, KLR X Kalel, and we're off this planet. Peace. For the fans, by the fans. Mm-hmm.